Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar series. My name is Carl Walter. I'm the National Security Manager uh, here at Esri out of our headquarters in Redlands, California. Our webinar today is titled Using ArcGIS to Locate Illegal Drug Farms. And the example that we'll, we will be focusing on today uh, will include illegal marijuana grows in U.S. national forests but realize that the tools that we're going to be showing you today apply anywhere globally um, where illegal cash crops are grown. And uh, that's important because uh, we've had, we have over 450 folks signed up for this webinar and our participants come from many countries. So if it's a issue with coca plants in South America um, and Bolivia, Peru or Colombia, uh, these tools will apply, or if it's a situation with opium poppy plants in Turkey, Pakistan, or Burma, again, these tools are uh, total, totally applicable to those scenarios also. Uh, essentially, if you have the data, uh, and we will uh, discuss that in full, you can conduct the types of analysis that we're going to be showing you today. So again, our, our discussion today really, uh, at its core, is going to be about site selection, uh, suitability analysis and predictive analytics. You should see in your uh, in your meeting window the ability to, to ask questions. Um, uh, generally, in these in these types of webinars, we will anticipate you know receiving as uh, as many as a hundred questions. So we will we will do our best to to address those questions, uh, certainly the simple ones, as we go. Uh, we will also follow up this webinar with a uh, with a series of links and a subsequent follow-up email that will give you um, uh, a lot more uh, information. Uh, our next slide. Uh, our presentation team uh, is going to include Robert Fairstein, who is a solutions engineer uh, on our national security team here at Esri, based out of our Sacramento office. Ian Campbell, from Esri Professional Services is a, is a project manager assigned to our defense and intelligence team. And we have Matthew Stewart from our, uh, 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 from SnapTrends, who is the partner manager uh, for that company, going to be discussing um, some of the more uh, tactical um, investigative elements that can be used by uh, leveraging social media. Next slide. So our agenda here, we are going to, again, talk a little bit about the uh, Esri Public Safety and National Security Webinar Series. We'll discuss briefly the and outline the problem of uh, illegal grows, illegal drug grows, marijuana grows. And then we'll um, switch that to a, a description of the predictive tools that we're going to be demonstrating today, along with a uh, with a live demonstration of uh, of those tools in action, actually showing you how to predict locations uh, most suitable to uh, to grow marijuana. Uh, we're going to switch a little bit not then from the predictive and suitability analysis piece to uh, a little more tactical investigative pieces where we're going to uh, bring in the uh, SnapTrend social media um, mining capability to identify uh, what we would argue are some uh, active uh, uh, drug-related postings. And then we're going to finish it up with a platform conversation on uh, uh, how you can leverage the platform for operational planning and resource deployment. Next slide. So our webinar series, this is a this is a national security uh, type of uh, presentation. Obviously, we do this for law enforcement, for CAD 911, as well as for emergency management, and uh, it is uh, it is our way to to keep us all connected. And, and again, like I said, we're going to um, uh, provide you with information, follow up information on how you can connect to these different series that we do. Um, usually on a monthly basis at a minimum. And it's, uh, it's, it's our way to show and to share trends in uh, our mapping technology and geographic analysis um, to display some, some great information and intelligence products that hopefully can support you know, different public safety or national security workflows 
And again, we want to show you, uh, you know, new and interesting and powerful capabilities. And we want to push not just our ideas out to you, but uh, ideas of what we see uh, amongst our client base, both domestically and internationally. So uh, next slide. So a, a brief discussion on, on illegal groves and a, a short outline of the problem. So the, uh, regardless of where you are, certainly in the 50 states and then, you know, in some of the other um, areas on the globe where uh, illegal cash crops are grown, you have uh, oftentimes uh, a host of agencies dealing with the, uh, what we, what, what's called the eradication process. So, so in the US, for example, you could have state police, National Guard, federal agencies like DEA and, uh, and other folks like our, like our HIDAs, all involved in this eradication um, in, in eradication strategies and sometimes they do this together sometimes they do this independently uh, and uh, and sometimes the uh, communication is uh, is difficult and challenging for instance on where one team has searched historically and the ability to prevent somebody from um, uh, wasting time and money and resources doing the exact same thing. So we know that in, the, in this space, the transnational crime organization, even foreign terrorist organizations, grow and sell uh, these cash crops to support their operations. And oftentimes, um, because of space and resources and security, rural areas like national forests uh, uh, are the locations where this occurs. So there is a um, a massive environmental impact um, due to the pesticides and herbicides used to actually cultivate these crops. Um, that is a, a separate conversation, an important conversation, but separate. We're not going to deal with that today. We're going to focus on the on the, the the crime issues there. So, you know, the remote locations are chosen for a couple reasons. You know, there is a level of security uh, from observation, and as well as for the uh, for the criminal groups doing this, there is a increased ability to detect intruders. And um, those intruders can be college kids hiking through a national forest coming upon a drug grow. And there is no shortage of examples of certainly threatening, if not violent, interactions between uh, uh, folks that uh, unfortunately stumble uh, across these illegal grows. So we know that there are limited resources in law enforcement. We also know that it's incredibly expensive to use air assets and ground assets for interdiction. Uh, um, and the areas, the geography of where these grows can occur are massive. Um, so it's difficult and it's expensive. And what we want to do is show how GIS can provide the tools and the support to optimize and make more efficient this eradication planning process. So the tool set, the ArcGIS predictive tool sets that we're gonna be displaying here will do a couple things. We are going to show known grow locations and we're going to interrelate that data with what we consider relevant geographic variables distance to water, distance to road, slope, et cetera. And uh, we're going to identify locations based on history, the previous grows, uh, where we would calculate and predict that uh, uh, suitability sites for uh, additional grows to occur and therefore a better way for us to direct not just air uh, patrol and surveillance, but, um, but ground patrol and surveillance to again, uh, be much more uh, specific uh, and tactical in how to spend time, money, and resources on the eradication process. So uh, a couple things before we um, get too deep into this, the information that we're using is, uh, is very real. We have made minor modifications to, uh, to maintain the anonymity of some of the agencies that we work with for this, uh, uh, for this type of analysis. But again, understand that what you're seeing is very real and is uh, uh, as close to accurate as we can po possibly do it again with, uh, with, uh, with protecting our, our clients that we work with. So we're gonna go through uh, just a couple brief photos here 
to show uh, what we're talking about. So this is an indoor grow and uh, for this exercise, we don't really care about this. We're gonna move on to what we would uh, kind of classify as outdoor grows, as you see in the pictures right here. This is, this is where we're gonna do the predictive analysis and analytics on. And the reason is, as you see in the next photo, is because of you know, the violence associated with what happens in these scenarios when, um, uh, when individuals, criminal organizations, foreign terrorist organizations uh, are responsible to protect this cash crop. So we are now going to move into uh, a, a series of slides where Rob Ferristein is going to kind of outline exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, and then we're gonna go into the actual demonstration of, uh, of how these analytics work. So Rob, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Carl. So again, I'm Rob Fierstein, a solution engineer with Esri. And over the last few years, we've been working with several of our partners in law enforcement uh, to leverage the technology to help identify these grows and to bring efficiency and intelligence and integrate that into the uh, operations, the surveillance and the planning and ultimately the prosecution and the eradication of these illegal crops. Um, here in Northern California, we have a lot of public lands and that's uh, very attractive for this illegal activity because um, growing these crops requires a lot of space, a lot of water. Again, like Carl said, the rural areas in Northern California and in other places around the country, they also provide that security. And so it's easy to see um, people coming from a distance or hearing them. Uh, these are very remote locations. And then ultimately, we look at the amount of money that is in this industry and in driving it. And so there's a lot of activity. And again, with some of these agencies, they have very, very few resources, whether it be people or just the financial, uh, you know, the capital to really support um, the resources to find these grows and to eliminate this activity. And so I'm just going to do a brief overview of some of the work Actually, I should say the altered summary of some of the work that we've done over the last few years. Again, um, this data that you're gonna see today um, has been altered to protect the sensitivity to the law enforcement uh, customers and what they're utilizing, but again, is, is a good representation of how these tools have matured and our methodology over the last few years. When we, when we first began, we used several um, different uh, spatial features and aspects um, in conjunction with the historic location of these marijuana grows in the model to try to find other areas that would be suitable for this type of activity. And so in doing so, we came up with different weights with these layers of data to try to come up with the most accurate um, projection or site selection modeling for the grows. And this is actually fairly simplistic. And what we also found is it, it didn't give us the results or the accuracy that we really wanted to have at the end results. And so this is a um, slightly altered, but a close depiction of what those tools gave us after that first iteration um, when, we, when we first started looking at this problem with our partners. And it was good, but we had a lot of room for improvement. So a few of the things that we learned was we didn't incorporate the major transportation routes and the population areas into our analysis. We also looked at imagery and we found that there were several grows occurring downstream from the reservoirs. We also believe this is because California has been in a major drought. And so the water needed for these grows was becoming more sparse. And so the major uh, transportation or the major uh, throughways for water, um, they were kind of gravitating towards that. So we needed to adjust our model. Um, areas that had been hit by fire in previous years had already been cleared out. And so the level of effort to prepare those lands for a grow was minimal. And then on the edge of the forest, closer to the population areas, we were also seeing clusters appear of these grows. And then also the, the output. 
So as you saw on that first iteration, it was kind of sparse and it only highlighted the areas that had a high likelihood of supporting you know, these grows based off of previous observations. But we also wanted to have a greater scale of seeing the areas least likely or a mid-range all the way up to the areas that are most likely or highly likely to support this activity. So we needed a continuous output, not just um, the areas highlighted with the most likely. So for the second iteration, we took a lot of that same data and then we added those missing uh, data, data sets to, again, come up with a more uh, detailed and accurate model at the end. And so with that, you can see here, we have several different weights and we really went deep going through these and we, we segmented them out more and we came up with a much more thorough weighting schema uh, to support the analysis. And you'll see the results here in a second uh, of what we came up with. So we took all those different weights and we applied it to the second iteration. We came up with a continuous output. So it's not just hot, it's not just the hot areas or the, those that are most likely. We have the cold as well as the mid-range in between throughout the entire area of interest uh, to support law enforcement. And like Carl said, so when they do their flight planning for surveillance, um, they have the areas that are the most likely, but then those that are the least likely, they might uh, put as a low priority for surveillance op operations in the future. And just a side-by-side -side comparison of iteration one versus iteration two. And now Ian is going to go into the technology and show you how this is done. So that was a uh, that was a good framework and foundation, Rob, of uh, of exactly what we're going to show in our desktop and our web tools. And in the past, uh, you know, operating on the on the Esri desktop, you know, sometimes that you know there's a lot of buttons and uh, potentially a lot of training required. But we're going to show you both on the desktop as well as in some web tools how we think this capability, the uh, the actual running of this technology, can be can be spread much more widely to maybe even non-technical people than was the case in the past. And Ian's going to describe that right now. Thanks, guys. So what you see on my screen is uh, ArcMaps open. We see uh, all these green locations. So these locations represent historical uh, um, pot farms in the El Dorado National Forest. Um, what we want to do, though, is, is take that data and look at the characteristics of that data and have it point us to other places that might be good to look, other suitable locations that we can then prioritize for our flights or for our uh, ground-based off, ground officers um, so that they maximize their time and cost. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to make use of a free ArcMap add-in which is available on our resource center. This is the web page for downloading it, getting documentation on uh, installing it and using it. Um, what happens once you install it is you get this toolbar in ArcMap. And I'm going to open up one of those tools. This is kind of the, the main uh, focus tool for doing our suitability analysis. We call it our query editor. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to query my data and ask it, where else should I be looking? Just a real quick example of this, I'm going to take my slope data set. So I have a lot of data sets here on the left-hand side. I'm going to take one of those, just slope, add it to my expression, and say, show me everywhere in this area that has a fairly low, or very low slope. Because uh, I think these farms are going to, going to uh, want to be on a flatter terrain. So if I hit run, now we see right away, pretty much immediately, um, all the areas in red that have a slope of less than two. Obviously, Lake Tahoe has a slope of zero, so it's showing up bright red. Um, what's nice is, and, and Rob kind of highlighted this with what he was saying, if you are trying to figure out what the constraints, what the right, the right constraints to use are, you can make changes to these tools very easily and quickly and rerun. So there I just changed the slope constraint to be less than five. You see a lot more uh, passing results on the map. Um, so you can use these tools manually. If you, uh, if you don't have those historical locations, you can build that out just using your own uh, subject matter expertise. But what we want to do is have that data 
tell us what constraints to use and tell us what data sets really matter. So to do that, we have another tool we call our query generator. And just like the name suggests it, it's going to help us automatically build that query logic for us. Um, so the first thing you do is you select your set of points. So this is your uh, set of points that you, you know uh, historically have mattered. And now you can pick which characteristic you care about. So these are all data sets that have full coverage over the area. I'm going to pick proximity to, to a water source. So just like Rob mentioned, being close to fresh water has got to matter for these farms. I'm going to click Analyze. And pretty much immediately, I, I correlate those 160 points uh, with how far away they are from a water source. And we can see the range here represented by this uh, histogram of how far all of them are from water. I can, if I want to at this point, kind of tighten up my query and say, use math, use statistics to tell me where there's really like a relevant grouping. What range should I really be using in my query to point me to the most suitable location based on how far they are from water? So that's what I've done here. And now it's telling me usually they're between about 300 and uh, 2,000 meters from, from a freshwater source. So I hit view query. And now what it's done is it's, it's brought me back to that previous tool, which is our query expression editor. But now it's built, it, built the query information for me. So here I have my range of values for how far away from water, a water source these points usually occur in. I click run. And now we see everywhere in red, We've basically made a buffer around all of the fresh water sources in the area. You see the buffer around Lake Tahoe, this lake up here, and so on and so on. If I uh, drag my narcotics locations up above that result, you can see most of those green uh, dots where we have historical sites, they, they mostly fall within or just out of that range, which makes sense because we use the information from those locations to build that, that query. So that's great, but that's just using one factor. What we want to do, like Rob was, Rob was showing, is use a lot more logic, use a lot more data sets to, to really help us whittle down the, the search area. So I'm going to um, just kind of skip to save some time and load in a previous run of this query generator tool, where I've taken into account uh, eight different data sets, just like I did before with the water data set. Here I'm using slope. And here's my range for slope between 0 and 5 degrees is where they usually are. I also have uh, my water source range, just as before. I also have a data set for uh, mobility. So uh, this is basically telling me that they don't want to uh, venture too far away from an access point to the park. So they, they drive into the park, but they stay within half an hour to an hour from that entry point. Um, so that'll help whittle down areas that are just too remote. They don't want to be driving all day to get to that farm location. When I click View Query, it creates a much more complex query. But like I said before, it, it's doing all of the math and all of these range, figuring out the ranges for us. So here's my slope range. And if we scroll down, you can see how much information went into this query. Um, here's my uh, range of values for how far away I am from water. And if I want to, I can still add to this. I can say um, avoid areas that don't have good cell phone coverage. Or uh, what I'm going to do is just add a, a simple constraint saying, I just want to do my analysis over just the El Dorado area. And let me just turn on weights since this is a more complex query. And we want to do a contiguous um, result, like Rob was saying, where we get uh, more of a color ramp than a yes, no answer. So here what we're seeing is suitability for the whole of the, the national forest here um, from green to red, red being the most suitable. So we see this whole area here is, is very suitable. We have some routes up here that actually probably are following along some roads because that was part of what makes them suitable and probably following along some, some stream areas as well. Um, if I bring back my uh, history, historic locations, you'll see a lot of those darker red areas are where we've seen them in the past. And that totally makes sense because we use those locations as our gold standard of where we want to look. But at this point, I, I have my first case of, of having some actionable evidence. So this area here, I would highlight 
I would tell whoever was flying the next uh, helicopter flight out there that I would prioritize this area. I'd also prioritize maybe this route up to the north and maybe this, uh, this route over here as well. Um, what's what's uh, really useful is you can share this out. You can share this, this result to wh whoever's uh, either on the ground or flying these routes. And as they fly the routes, they can share that information as well. Let me just hide that result so you can see. And as I fly that northern route, I can share that out. I can maybe on in February, I fly this route over here. And in March, I fly over here. If we turn back on the, uh, the result, now I know I can, if, if I'm flying a route in April, the last three months, here we have the different flights we took. We don't need to worry about those locations. Now I want to prioritize maybe this area down here in the south or this more orangish red area here and, and look for them in other areas. So that's great. We're helping out the guy in the air. Um, one other thing I want to show just real quickly is uh, we want to help uh, the law enforcement officers on the ground. So we have this area, this region here where we had uh, a lot of red area where we hadn't actually caught them before. And what we want to do is use our route finder tool and say, show me the route that they would have to take to get to the nearest entry point to the park. So I'll turn that on. So moving to this entry point uh, represented by this red asterisk, if I select my mobility data set, which is my time of travel, to that El Dorado access point, I can just dynamically click anywhere in this area and it'll find the least cost path back to that entry point to the park. It'll tell me how long it takes, um, uh, up to an hour for some of these. And it will also just visually tell me where there's some good choke points. So there's a good choke point here. But another th interesting thing to note that is if I also wanted to stop this guy off to the left, um, I wouldn't be stopping him if I set up a roadblock here to, to, to look for these guys traveling on the roads. So I would need to set up maybe a, another choke point here or prioritize a, a primary choke point here. Um, so that's, that's all I'm showing for the desktop. Let me just switch real quickly back to um, what we're working on currently, and that's porting some of these tools to a web-based solution. So usually when we do the desktop-based demo, everybody wants to see it on their iPad. Um, see it on a mobile device, see it on a lightweight uh, laptop that they can take with them. Um, and that's what we've been working on, is building some web-based widgets that can run on a thin client. So this is the web page for uh, getting access to that, getting the documentation, the install guide, and setting it up on your own system. Um, and here's an example of the web tools running live. So what, uh, this is a, a, a web app builder-based web app. Um, three our three widgets that we have. I'm just going to run a quick query, and what you can see here is that I've predefined a query, um, which is a really powerful thing because you can have your subject matter expert back at the office know what logic to use in their in their suitability. Let me just refresh this because I had the web page open too long. Sorry about that. You can have your subject matter expert um, predefine the query and do all the logic for that ahead of time. And you, you, as the user, just need to open up the web page and run the, run the query. So here I'm, I'm saying over the entire continental US, uh, show me where slope is low, land cover is not water, and elevation is low. I'll hide that, and you see, just within a matter of seconds, we have everywhere in green where, that, where those constraints pass. Now, this isn't a scenario-based thing, but it's, it's powerful, and I wanted to show it because it's using three different data sets that each are, are about 80 gigabytes on disk, and they can be coming from multiple server machines. They can be coming from our ArcGIS Online. Um, they can be coming from your own uh, server portal, um, and we can merge those together and get the result just in a matter of seconds, which is really powerful to do on a thin client application. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Carl. All right, thank you, Ian. So we, uh, what we just showed you here, uh, you know, a combination of uh, desktop tools and web tools that with, with the ability to, uh, to process massive, massive geographic files very, very quickly. And then actually some um, uh, 
you know, the ease of use for, for the user and the user experience with, you know, fewer and, and bigger buttons uh, to help with the prioritization. And when you're talking about technology to really to support operations, in this case, it's, I mean, it's really, really evident here where you can, um, you can prioritize through these predictions and these suitability uh, analytics, you can prioritize where to search, where not to search, and really, really save time and money because with with budgets for gasoline and uh, and flight crews and pilots, it's expensive. And if somebody, if an agency literally only has the ability to do, you know, uh, ten flights uh, in a gross season, they want to pick the most optimal uh, routes. Uh, that will bring them the highest yield return for their for their time and their money. And I think we just showed how we can uh, uh, identify those locations, archive the historical information to prevent people from reflying the same routes, and the ability to share that out uh, so other agencies know uh, should you want to share that information so other uh, agencies know where to go and know uh, where not to go based on um, uh, based on the information sharing. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here and go, you know, from the, the predictive suitability analysis to kind of a more uh, tactical view of what, what we like to call find a drug dealer. And we, uh, uh, we asked our partner SnapTrends to come in and show a different, uh, a couple different workflows on, on how this can be done. And, and the important thing here is you're going to see some, uh, you know, some, some, high-end social media intelligence scraping um, that's going to occur in this application, but we're going to show you the, um, the connectivity between Snap Trends and the ArcGIS platform, both desktop and, and, uh, and, and online, where some of the, uh, the high-end analytics can occur on, uh, on the Snap Trends side, and the results can be shared through a feature service into the uh, onto the Esri side with a, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, essentially creating a dynamic link where updates occur on both sides uh, as new information comes in from the uh, social media world. So Matt, I'm going to uh, turn this over to you and uh, show us how to find a drug dealer. Perfect, thank, thank you, Carl. Thanks for joining us everyone today. What you're seeing uh, now is, is the SnapTrends interface uh, just over the Sacramento area, so very close to the workflows that we've been doing in the El Dorado Forest. But what I'm going to do now is kind of walk you through what Carl was mentioning and how we help our clients and what we can do to help in these specific work workflows as well. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to just create a search parameter, um, a geofence, uh, an umbrella, a search perimeter around the Sacramento area. And I'm going to just add in a couple of uh, keywords here. And I'm going to just add, add in lead to start. You know, basically, we're, we're trying to find a needle in a haystack here. We're trying to find somebody out there on social media that's openly publicly posting, hey, you know, I've got weed or I, I want to sell weed or, you know, just an example that we can find and try and get some intelligence from social media on very specific locations. And what we're doing here is looking at Twitter, we're looking at Instagram, you know, Facebook pages, YouTube, Google Plus, VK, and Flickr, because a lot of people have multiple social media sites at this, this time of year so or the, these days, and so we want to make sure we're capturing as much information from those sites as possible. So you see a lot of people talking about, about weed here in the California Sacramento area, and I just found this, this guy here. He's got you know, a couple of blocks full of America's Best Weed, and so what I want to do, that just kind of is, is a red flag. You know, it could be nothing. It could be something. So what I want to do here is I want to go into his little Twitter profile summary. And so what we give you the ability to do is quickly understand, you know, a little bit more about who this person is. Okay, they're in the Pacific time. They've got 470 friends. They've got a lot of favorites. So this person is, is at least okay on, you know, Twitter. So we're going to kind of dive in and keep going. So what I'm going to do now is click over to the media pictures and videos. And so what you see here, you see our picture that we just found in, in the site there. And then we also have some other pictures that depict, you know, some weed, maybe some other things. It looks like there's a little duck uh, bong there that you might want to investigate a little bit further. You can look at the pictures if you want to as well. Click through those quickly to, you know, kind of see who this person is, what they're taking pictures of, you know, more pictures of him or her smoking weed there. And a lot of pictures that have been deleted, which might be a, a red flag to this person because they're trying to get maybe incriminating information off of social media. And in that case, if you wanted to, you know, start monitoring this person, 
uh, ongoing because it, it might be a red flag. You can save them into the snap trend system for more analysis, you know, further down the line. Another good thing you can do is find locations of interest of that person. So where they have checked in, um, you know, where they have shared their location with you over the course of time. And for that post that I found, he shared his location here in the in the Sacramento area. So you get a good understanding of where that person has been. And so if I zoom out a little bit further, you can start to see if this person's got a pattern of life across the world, across the state, et cetera. So you can see this person travels between, it looks like Fresno and Sacramento. So you get a good understanding of where he's been over time if you're interested in having a conversation, et cetera. You can also do some really cool things on social media by you know, seeing who this person is, is you know, in a relationship on social media with. And in Twitter's example, what that's gonna be is you know the one-to-one -one connections i'm following you you're following me or the one ways where they're following me or i'm following them and so you can go through quickly and see the one-to-one -one connections of this individual that means you know i'm following them they're following me it's probably friends in real life and a lot of times friends in real life or friends on uh, social media as well and vice versa so you can quickly go through these and then automatically if you wanted to investigate those individuals further you can do that uh, as well Another thing that you can do within the uh, Snap Trend system is, is save persons of interest, like I mentioned before, and that will give you uh, more ability to kind of analyze their social media footprint. Snap Trends gives you the ability to save multiple social media accounts from one individual into the same area so you can monitor you know, multiple at one time. And you can see here I'm monitoring three different accounts of our one specific individual. We've got about 3,000 or 4,000 posts here. You know, there's a lot more data than we had previously by just finding that one post. And we do that by giving you the ability to use the auto search function. And what that does is that goes and looks at these social media accounts that we found for this individual and looks for other blogs, websites, social media sites, et cetera. Typically we find that, you know, everybody today or a person that's uh, young and upcoming, maybe even middle age has, you know, at least four or five different social media accounts, blogs, websites that they're attached to. So we give you ideas, leads, et cetera, that you can add to this person's of interest. So over time, when you're cleaning that information, you're starting to get a much bigger picture than what you had previously uh, on that social media site. And then what you can do with all this information, any information you have saved in Snap Trends. So if you wanted to save a specific search around your town, if you wanted to save a search around you know El Dorado National Forest and start pulling in information uh, from those specific areas or maybe monitor those specific growth sites that, that uh, uh, Esri was mentioning previously. We can set up those safe searches for you and then we can also save that and send that information over to Esri with our uh, geo service link. And all you have to do basically is, is copy and paste this link within the Snaptrend system into your you know, ArcGIS account and be able to display the social media data that you've collected in Snap Trends um, into the Esri platform. And so that's just the kind of a high level overview of Snap Trends, how it could relate or help you in your searches in real time or over time monitor those areas of interest for you know, finding a drug dealer, finding an illegal grow, et cetera. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Carl. So, so thanks, Matt. I think that's a, that's a great review of really how to uh, how to mine social media and help us uh, uh, dir get direction on things to investigate. And again, the key piece there is the connector between um, uh, between our two applications, right? Our two platforms. We don't. Esri does not want to rebuild the you know the tools, the R and D that's that's gone into uh, everything that the uh, that Snap Trends has done. We just want ha has completed. We just want to leverage the results of that information uh, within. Uh, within our geospatial platform, and uh, and Matt, I think you showed a great example of how we can do that. So the next uh, the next piece of presentation here that we want to focus on goes uh, back to the uh, ArcGIS platform and how to actually support a a tactical planning process, uh, managing resources and police, law enforcement assets. Uh, within this problem set, and Rob's going to kind of take us through a, uh, a portal demonstration on how the platform can act as a uh, not just a, a content management uh, um, capability, but how we can really provide, you know, uh, on the ground support to folks conducting tactical raids. So, Rob, I'll let you go through this piece. Hey, thanks, Carl and Matt. 
Uh, again, this is Portal for ArcGIS, and this is the hub. So think about this as your, your web-based hub that can be put behind your firewall and made secure to support law enforcement and other sensitive types of operations. And so we have all of our data in here. We have apps, we have tools, um, we have all kinds of abilities for not just mapping, but analytics and co collaboration. And it's in this technology is designed so it could be used by anyone at any time, anywhere. So any of your devices can leverage this technology. And so it's just a great collaboration tool. And so I'm gonna show you just a couple applications um, one being for tactical planning. So Matt went through the power of snap trends and leveraging social media and how it could be used um, in law enforcement and counter drug. And so I'm gonna take that information that Matt made available via a web service and I'm gonna add it here into my web map and display it in support of my tactical planning. So let me go ahead and disable some time here. And you see these two posts right here uh, around the Sacramento region. And so let's go ahead and zoom into that, that northern activity there where we believe the transactions are taking place. So as I zoom in, we get some more detail on the map. We can hit the pop-up. Uh, we can get that information coming from Snap Trends um, on this individual and their social activity. Um, this map is great, but now that we're going down to the tactical level, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and switch it up to the imagery, get a little bit more detail. Um, this looks like a golf course parking lot. Maybe it's just the area where this person does their business. Maybe they work there, who knows? But obviously, if you want to engage this individual, maybe bring them in for further questioning, maybe you have additional information related to a case, um, who knows what that is. But obviously, this golf course is probably not gonna be where you wanna target them. And like Matt mentioned, through using social media and the power snap trends and doing that pattern of life and you're in confirming maybe um, the location, uh, the home location of that individual using other intelligence sources or maybe other information you have that came up in the investigation, you can identify their home or their place of residence where they're at a regular, on a regular basis. So what you're seeing pop up on the screen here, screen here is some pre-populated um, tactical operation planning elements. So what we've done, you know, over the last couple of years, working some of our great customers and partners in the tactical community, is we've tried to come up with some features that are commonly used across the country during a tactical plan. Time and time again, we would see our customer partners using, you know, paper or a whiteboard or all these different, you know, old school ways of coming up with a tactical plan, but there's, there's a big hole in that because once you write out that tactical plan in the briefing room or wherever it is on that piece of paper, it stops there. Um, you can't adjust it. You can't make changes on the fly. It doesn't come up on your mobile device or a laptop in your vehicle. Um, it can't be shared with several people simultaneously to interact with it to see, you know, what that plan is. Um, if something were to go wrong or it needs to be, that information needs to be leveraged at a later time, say for um, court, for litigation, for an after action review, or for training purposes, GIS, and in this case, Portal for our GIS, houses all that information as a common system of record to keep that information uh, for later use. So let me show you how easy it is to use this. Um, all you have to do is click on the piece that you want and you can place it on the on the map so whether it's the crisis negotiation team or maybe you want to go ahead and identify you know the primary entry point for the operation you can put all this on the map you can easily move different pieces around so maybe team three needs to stand off a little bit whatever it may be all of this um, through web gis can enable your tactical operations combine your intelligence elements, your command elements, your tactical team, and your support elements all into one common operational environment. And the great thing about it is here I use the urban situation, but say in the case of the, uh, you know, these rural marijuana grows, we can do the same thing, use these planning elements to go ahead and plan our, you know, drug grow seizure, um, our ingress routes, all of our different phase lines, 
um, can be incorporated in here for the tactical plan and obviously the objective. Uh, we do hear time again that sometimes, you know, the wrong place is hit. This clearly identifies the objective so there's no confusion on what the target is. And again, can be shared and, and, and cover your, your region and your area of operations. Carl, do you want to take it from here for the next application? Yes, yeah, so we're going to now move into um, uh, a, a web application called Story Maps. And, you know, we've shown you some of the kind of the strategic analysis and the, uh, and the suitability and predictive components, some of the tactical capabilities that, um, that Matt on the social media side uh, showed in identifying potential drug activity and Rob on how to plan for a, uh, a law enforcement response to, to that drug activity. So, uh, you know, you think of those as analytical platforms. We're now gonna go uh, within the same uh, ArcGIS platform into uh, what, what I would kind of call a communication platform. So here we are able to embed the, what the web maps that we've been using throughout this, uh, uh, throughout this webinar directly into what, what may look almost like a PowerPoint screen, um, but, it's the, but, it, but it's ArcGIS and it's the, uh, it's the Story Maps web app. So here you can embed these web apps, uh, web maps, and actually provide, you know, photos or narrative like you have here on the right hand side and you see you know Rob's doing what we call a swipe map that's showing the the difference between the uh, the two iterations that um, that we walked you through earlier on so again it's just a uh, it's a great example of how to uh, communicate th for um, maybe a pre-raid or communicate for an after action report you know, here this is just an example of uh, of where you can actually download the predictive tools from, and uh, and then here again, you know, same thing. The uh, the web version, uh, we'll show this to you guys uh, through uh, subsequent emails, and then this is an example of what Matt was showing here, and again, the the ability to present this in a uh, uh, in a really interesting um, uh, format. Because here, as this, as this, uh, as the web piece loads right here, we can show you that everything that Rob just showed you in his in his web app and his web map, we can now integrate that in to the presentation tools. So instead of being on a whiteboard or a chalkboard, or you know, a, a big piece of paper on the hood of a car. You can actually do this in a command center, explain what needs to be done. And, you know, we also, I, I, I think, talked around, you know, the ability to, to deploy this in a, in a mobile fashion. So everything you're seeing here can go from command center to field to, a, you know, to a desktop, to a iPad or, or smartphone, um, uh, allowing, you know, for the, uh, for, for the ultimate communication. So I think that's bringing us towards the end of, um, uh, of the technical demonstration here. We, we received quite a few questions. I, I'm just looking kind of at uh, what has been unanswered. And I'll, uh, I'll go to, uh, so again, everybody that asked a question that, that we didn't answer to you directly will respond back to you in email but I'll just get some of the ones that we can uh, answer pretty quickly. And I'll, 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 I'll throw this over to Rob, this question. So Rob, the, the tools that you displayed here talk about the difference between development and configuration and the, uh, 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 and the, the skill set that it takes to do some of the things that you did. That's a, that's a great question, Carl. Um, so as far as the development goes, luckily uh, Ian and his team have done a phenomenal job doing that. So it is just configuration, meaning you download the tools, you can use it with um, the platform, so either desktop or the web environment, depending on what suits your operational needs or your organizational needs. And the best thing, the thing I would give, the advice I would probably strongly recommend is understanding your operational conditions and working with your operators and the folks out in the field to understand what they're seeing in the patterns because the modus operandi of these organizations and these patterns is going to change from place to place. So what happens in Northern California might not happen in Kentucky. And so um, understanding those conditions and making those changes to the data like Ian showed you um, and adjusting those weights within the model 
to get the most accurate output that you can. All right, great, thanks. Um, we had some, uh, I guess, issues that may have come up with uh, with audio and the and the ability to to view what we were showing. I think I think we mentioned um, uh, apologies for any technical concerns. Everything that we just showed you uh, is going to be recorded and made available to you folks in in uh, in follow up email. So if you have uh, as well as with our um, our addresses, our, our email addresses and whatnot. Rob, you can put those up on the screen now too, just so so people can grab them. Even though we're going to uh, uh, we're going to be sending stuff out. Uh, so a question came in on the social media piece, and and I will uh, answer it the best I can. And Matt, maybe you can weigh in also that the that the example uh, that we showed with social media in an urban area. How can we use this in a in a rural area so obviously you know if, the, if there's no connectivity um, you know you're not able to post the social media but in a, you know in a scenario like here you go down into your I would say your investigative phases you uh, you identify people that uh, that you know are linked to these groups and I, I think Matt showed you some of the link analysis capabilities that allow you to spiral and spider out um, uh, to identify different individuals and different leads and their friends and their connections and whatnot. So in that scenario, you're right. If uh, if you don't have connecti connectivity in a rural area, uh, the social media will have its limitations, and you just have to be creative and uh, and kind of uh, uh, you know you know find ever other levers to pull there. Uh, Matt, anything that you would add to that? Yeah, sure. Just just want a couple things there, Carl. Thanks for that question. Um, so on that sort of thing, I know a lot of people, um, that is true, Carl, what you were mentioning, you know, a lot of people, if you don't have, you know, cell phone service, you can't post. A lot of people, even, you know, myself and a lot of friends that I know, a lot of times you'll go on trips and you'll you'll probably post some along the way, but you have a, a multitude of pictures or multitudes of things that you want to say that you just don't have time to say when you're on a vacation. So a lot of people will post you know, a lot of their pictures with those geo coordinates or registered location or some sort of geo tag uh, when they get home. And so that's another way that you can kind of, you know, look at that information as well. It might not be, you know, right at the exact time as they see it or take that picture, but they might upload that later on. So there's always that, that, that chance that you can catch some things as well that way. Great. Thanks, Matt. So we had a question on the use of UAVs. So I, uh, Great question, and um, you, you know, it may, it's probably one of those scenarios where technology is kind of outpaced uh, policy and law, and it's a, it's a moving area. But I would absolutely say that you know, if UAVs are available within uh, within your agency, that uh, it's a lot cheaper to program where to fly one of those than it is to you know, to man outfit and uh, and gear up a flight crew in a helicopter. So I, I would envision that um, that there is a significant future there. Uh, Ian, a question came in on the um, uh, uh, the predictive analysis tools. Can you uh, outline maybe a couple different use cases? I mean, we showed predicting marijuana grows. Uh, can you identify a couple other use cases of where uh, this this these predictive tools can be used? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, actually, it's pretty wide reaching because um, I mean the the tools were made to be able to be flexible and answer a variety of problems. So we've worked with the um, Port of Long Beach and the and the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, to um, help with the problem of uh, boats that are smuggling up the coast of California from Mexico, uh, either drugs or human trafficking. That's um, one, one big example that we sometimes show. And what's interesting there is that that's a maritime-based demo as opposed to a terrain-based demo, which is what we've been focusing on in this uh, demonstration. So as long as you have the data to support the analysis, you can plug it into those tools. Another uh, example, um, one of our co-workers at Esri actually, before he worked at Esri, um, did uh, his uh, doctorate dissertation on uh, detecting where the most likely outbreaks for dengue fever in Africa would be. So similar ways of doing suitability analysis looking for farms, but factoring in different health-based uh, characteristics and saying here's where outbreaks 
earthquakes have ha occurred in the past, where should we set up our new health centers to be most effective? Um, there's a lot of other examples uh, beyond that. Um, and, and you mentioned UAVs. We actually have, have talked to a UAV company about um, possibly using these tools and incorporating in line of sight of the UAVs so that they get the, the most bang for their buck when they fly, fly uh, and look over cropland. Um, and there's a bunch more, but. Great. And Ian, uh, we may want to address some of this uh, through a subsequent email, but the question came up on on data. Do you want to just talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the data sets they used and uh, how, uh, how difficult or how easy it was to acquire them? Sure, sure. Uh, so we do have some tools within the tool set itself for creating data. Um, I didn't I didn't go through those because those do take some time. So you can create proximity data sets and mobility data sets by factoring in, um, you know, I have a road data set. I want to calculate all through my area how far I am from road just based on distance. But maybe you also want to create a mobility data set. I'm in a Jeep. I can go this fast on roads, off roads, high slope, low slope, different types of terrain. Um, and you can factor that into another one of our tools called the Speed Model Builder. So that was all kind of behind the scenes. We just didn't show those. Uh, but if you want, you can go online and it'll, it'll walk you through those tools. Um, kind of best practices for creating those, the, those data sets is you want to keep them all in the same projection. You want to keep them all um, the same cell size. Um, we're working off of uh, what's called raster data sets as opposed to vector. So uh, they're made up of pixels, and each of the pixels is what you're seeing turn on and off in those results. So um, I can get a, a more detailed best practice on that. Um, I think we've written that somewhere. So I can send Great. And then this is for probably Rob and for Ian, and I will, uh, uh, I'll take a stab at it also. So the question came in, uh, we talked about the, the different types of use cases that you can apply these predictive tools towards. And the question came in, uh, is it possible to apply these statistics to indoor marijuana groves? So um, uh, I would say the, the short answer to that is probably, and, uh, and it would be, uh, you know, a little bit different than what we showed here, but if you have the supporting data, uh, uh, like we had, so we had, you know, we had previous grow information, you know, if you're a law enforcement uh, agency, you have the, you know, you should have the um, uh, uh, previous previous raid activity or arrest activity for indoor grows. And we could apply the same principles very easily. Um, I, I don't, again, we were able to test our data on real information and we'd be happy uh, if, you know, uh, offline uh, working with you on that problem set, you know, if you want to help us pro uh, provide some of that information and we can, uh, we can probably work through some of that and and test if it's if it's um, if it's accurate or not. But I will uh, I'll see if Rob has a different way of answer that, and then Ian, if there's anything additional that he could add. Well, I see that our time's almost up, so we'll keep it short. Um, yes, please contact us. We'd be happy to work with you. We've had several conversations around that. We're also going to be presenting on this at UC at our user conference in San Diego in June. So we hope to see some of you there as well. Perfect. And then, uh, and yes, I, I did lose track of time. So we have, uh, we have several questions that we did not get to. We will, uh, especially the last one is a little more complicated. We can probably handle that offline. And any further questions that you folks want to provide us, you, our emails are up on the screen here. Please reach out to us and we will be sending you, as discussed, uh, subsequent uh, information and follow-up opportunities through email for those of you that uh, that logged in today. So that uh, that ends our call today, folks. Thanks very much for your time, and um, uh, uh, we hope to hear from you next time when we're doing the next webinar. Thanks.